This is America's Roundtable. Visit us at americasrt.com. Follow us on Twitter at americasrt. You can find us on YouTube and Facebook. Like and share. This is America's Roundtable, a weekend program from the nation's capital, focusing on the economy, liberty, and security. I am Joel Anand Sami, your co-host, joined by Natasha Sardorch, co-founder of the International Leaders Summit and former contributor to the Economist Intelligence Unit. We're delighted to have with us our guest, John Blundell. Mr. Blundell is the Distinguished Senior Fellow of the London-based Institute of Economic Affairs and author of Waging the War of Ideas, Margaret Thatcher, Portrait of an Iron Lady, and Ladies for Liberty, Women Who Made a Difference in American History. He is a former president of the Atlas Economic Research Foundation, the Institute for Humane Studies, and the Charles G. Koch Foundation. Between 1993 and 2009, he served as Director General and Ralph Harris Fellow of the Institute of Economic Affairs, described by Andrew Marr of the BBC as undoubtedly the most influential think tank in modern British history. Mr. Blundell has dedicated his career to ensuring that personal liberty is a leading concern in policy and academic discussions the world over. He serves on the board of directors of three conservative groups in America. It is a delight to have you join us, John. Hello, John. Hi, it's great to be with you. In your book, Margaret Thatcher, A Portrait of the Iron Lady, you depicted the life of Margaret Thatcher, her achievements as British Prime Minister, and her life since retirement. Uh, it is important for our readers to realize that you have known Margaret Thatcher since 1970. John, what are some of the most striking qualities that you have observed when following Lady Thatcher's extraordinary life? Well, I devote a whole chapter in, in my book to, um, to, to that issue. Um, I think possibly, um, above all, she was able to synthesize. She could take really quite complex, complex ideas and make them um, understandable. She was a bit like Newt Gingrich in that regard, and she didn't say, at this moment in time, she said, now, very short, precise Anglo-Saxon words uh, to convey uh, what were often quite complex uh, issues to do with inflation or trade unions or the IRA or the EU or whatever it might be. And she, she was able to simplify and, and communicate what would you say, John, would be Lady Thatcher's most important achievements as we all reflect on her extraordinary life? There's so many. Um, I mean, she squeezed inflation out of the economy. She privatized all those vast industries that were making huge losses and turned them into productive uh, enterprises that now pay taxes. Uh, she uh, started the process that led to peace in Northern Ireland. Uh, she fought off some of the worst uh, policies of the European Union. Uh, she brought the trade unions back under the rule of law um, and gave them back to their members, took the leadership away from the extremists and gave the leadership back to the ordinary members. Um, she, she, did, she did so many things. It's, it's quite incredible to think back. She made us walk tall again as Brits with a, a principled uh, approach to uh, foreign policy and the international rule of law. And um, took us from I mean, being the 19th ranked country in the OECD uh, to the second ranked country in the OECD. Uh, when, when you look at her, she was effectively a three term president. Um, she came to power in, uh, for, in 79 and left in 90, so she did 11 and a half years. Margaret Thatcher famously said, I always feel 10 years younger despite the jet lag when I set foot on American soil. There is something so positive, generous, and open about the people, and everything actually works. How would you interpret her statement comparing the life in Britain and the U.S. at the time? Well, she loved America. She loved Ronald Reagan. Um, she, she came to America twice in the 60s. That were very long trips. And in those days, uh, it was so expensive before airlines were deregulated. Uh, it was so expensive to cross the Atlantic. And once you got here, you tended to stay a little longer than the maybe people do now, but she did three, uh, sorry, two, she did two coast-to-coast -coast, um, trips in the late 60s, 
visiting all parts of America. Uh, one was sponsored by the State Department, uh, and one was sponsored by the um, English Speaking Union. And um, she really fell in love with America. Uh, well, she she knew um, she, she came to power when Carter was president. Uh, Carter didn't like her very much, um, and he found he couldn't get a word in edgeways. He complained. And then there was the eight years, of course, of Ronald Reagan, who she knew already. Ronald Reagan had visited her twice in London. Both times he was meant to spend an hour with her, and both times they were meeting Ronald for three hours. And um, uh, she, she, she felt ten years younger, and she, 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 there was a new step, in a, a spring in her step, uh, when she set front foot in America. John, in regard to the relationship that she had with President Ronald Reagan, you mentioned that Ronald Reagan and Lady Thatcher developed a very close relationship. And Lady Thatcher stated this when talking about Ronald Reagan. He is one of the greatest men of our time. He won the Cold War without firing a shot, not without a little help from his friends. What was the base and what were the common beliefs for their close working relationship? Well, they both believed in liberty. Uh, they both uh, knew instinctively that, that the propaganda put out by, by, from, from Moscow it was nothing uh, to be believed that, that, that uh, economic statistics coming out of Russia, um, they, they both, but as early as the 50s and 60s, it's quite clear that Thatcher and Reagan um, were, were convinced that the, the Russian experiment was doomed to fail. Um, Margaret Thatcher said as early as 1951, uh, that as long as we stick to our principles, uh, we have nothing to fear from Russian communism. Well, that was quite an extraordinary thing to say back in 51. Um, I was a schoolboy in the 60s and can remember uh, being taught how to hide under a desk when the, when the Russian bombs came. And this is one of the in 51, saying we've got nothing to fear as long as, as we stick to principle. And I think that's what they, they had in common. They, they had a common set of principles, and unlike most politicians, they actually stuck to their principles. That is so true that you've mentioned the importance of principle leadership, and I recall a statement that was relayed by Lady Thatcher, when you know confronting some of the challenges uh, right uh, in her own um, backyard, when she said, "The problem with socialism is that you eventually run out out of other people's money," and uh, you know she really said it and uh, confronted these issues right on. No, she was she was very good. At, like, like I said earlier, communicating ideas, and she she was also very housewifely or homely, and, and she would often use. Uh, examples from from uh, people's uh, daily experience, the experience of being a housewife and uh, looking after a family, and, and, and she used these uh, analogies to, to to make her, her points uh, that uh, would be what we would call sort of macroeconomic points. And she made them very simply, very clearly, and people understood uh, understood what she was saying. Uh, Margaret Thatcher came from a hard working, and John, as you mentioned in your book a self-employed backbone of Britain who were pulling themselves and their families up the economic and social ladders on their own initiative. At the same time, in America, Ronald Reagan raised to the U.S. presidency, originally coming from a relatively poor family, and in his early years working hard, working multiple jobs to pay his college costs and send money home to his economically hard-hit family. Uh, both Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan were principled leaders and not elitists. What do you think was that set of circumstances that got these extraordinary leaders in power? And I have to repeat, principled and non-elitist. And can we expect to see a race to power of men and women of same leadership qualities in the near future? Oh gosh, that's, uh, that's quite a question. Um, yes, Mar Margaret's background was very much uh, self-employment. Um, as far as we've been able to track her family tree back on both sides, um, her, her um, ancestors were all uh, small business people. And she grew up above a family shop, uh, a grocery shop. Uh, and in those days, um, groceries came in, in bulk, and it was the grocer who, who made them a bit of packages. And that was, as a young girl, she used to help her father uh, make up the packages. He would order uh, 70 pounds of sugar 
and, and then they would make them into you know, half pound and one pound bags. Um, so she, she got very, in a very practical um, uh, way, um, doing these kinds of chores. Um, there was no uh, radio or TV, and um, she would go every week with her father to the local public library and come back with uh, armloads of, of, of books. And uh, her parents uh, were very much um, involved in local politics and uh, adult conversation ruled at the table. There was no uh, sort of condescending to young, young, young Margaret and her sister. Uh, the conversation at the breakfast table, lunch table, dinner table uh, would have been uh, very adult and concerned with local uh, political issues. And her father was a councilman, and then an alderman, then a mayor, uh, and during World War II, he was an air raid precaution warden looking out at night for, for, for German bombers coming in to bomb the local uh, munitions factory. Mm. Um, so it was very um, uh, hard working. Uh, she, she jumped to grade at, at, at school. Um, she got to university when she was still um, just 17. And, um, and, and you, you worked hard. As uh, you've mentioned uh, in your book about her upbringing and uh, the challenges and difficulties she and her family members experienced, it's, all, it's also important to remind our listeners about how London was bombed uh, uh, during that period uh, under Nazi Germany. And uh, life must have been very difficult, and, and I'm sure that uh, that impression of uh, having to run to a shelter uh, as the bombs were falling ingrained that importance of liberty and uh, the concern that tyranny and oppression had on the lives of many individuals. And uh, hence her efforts to dismantle what we knew as the evil empire, uh, the Soviet Union. She stood for those principles of personal liberty and uh, certainly inspired a, a new generation across Europe. And she very much got those ideas from her father. And it's quite clear that Alf uh, Roberts, her, her maiden name was Margaret uh, Roberts, um, and Alf Roberts was uh, a huge influence um, on her uh, political thinking. She was, she was already um, a, 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 um, a great believer in liberty before, before she got to university. It's obvious that these ideas were formed uh, in her, her, her mid-teens by, by the books that her father had her reading. How did she rise to power as a woman and a non-elitist at that time? Well, to begin with, being a woman didn't help very much because the women on the selection committees uh, for the conservative associations, um, they, they all um, thought she was a bit pushy and they wanted a, a nice young man who would got a, a few medals in the war, uh, a pretty wife who stayed at home and looked after their 2.5 children. Whereas here was this uh, chemist uh, who'd become, who she, Margaret first trained as a chemist, uh, then switched to the law and then became an attorney, um, and uh, worked, worked uh, very hard. And uh, had uh, her husband was quite wealthy. She married a, a businessman who had got a, quite a nice business, and he um, uh, she could afford a couple of nannies to, to stay uh, to stay home and, and look after the twins. And um, she kept coming second, time and time and time again, she came second in the selection process until she got Finchley uh, by a whisker, by about, I think, two votes out of about a hundred. Um, she got selected for, for Finchley. From then on, being a woman helped her enormously um, because there were so few women in politics um, back, back then. I mean, the, the, the entire 650 members of parliament, and uh, I, I would guess it was probably some like 15 women uh, in total, 15 or 20, some tiny number like that. And she was the formidable talent, you know, the chemist, somebody who can train as a chemist and then become an attorney, obviously he's got brains. And, um, and there was always felt to be a need to have a woman, um, a, a woman or two in, 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 in um, in, amongst the ranks of the ministers. And when Edward Heath became Prime Minister in 1970, um, he turned to one of his friends and said, well, who's going to be the statutory woman in the cabinet? Because by 1970, you know, you had to have at least one woman in the cabinet. And it was obvious it was going to be Margaret. She was by far and away the most talented female 
Conservative, and she was made Secretary of Education. Right. And uh, served as Secretary of Education from 70 to 74. And then when Edward Heath lost in 74 twice, um, she was the one who uh, eventually emerged to challenge him and became leader in 75, and then Prime Minister in 1979. Lady Thatcher was the longest serving Prime Minister of the 20th century, as you already mentioned, John, and had 11 and a half years to get the job done. In your book, you summarize key strategic lessons that you have identified from Margaret Thatcher. Would you kindly share some of them with our listeners today? Certainly. Um, I think above all, she had a very strong personal, uh, political and moral compass, um, and, and that helped it build a very good teamwork. She was able to cut through the gut and the nonsense and the you know, embellishments that politicians often uh, uh, use and, and communicate very simply. She led and expected a great deal from, from pe people uh, around her. She also tended to champion policies that went with the grain of human nature, such as the uh, way they sold off the big nationalised industries and the way they sold off her uh, public housing. She did a lot of strategic thinking ahead of time. You see, she became leader of the party in 75 and uh, didn't become Prime Minister until 79. And she used those four years to do a lot of reading and thinking and, and, and planning. Um, she surrounded herself with dedicated, smart people who got their own merits, not because of um, their money or their, their birth. Also, circumstances helped her. She was, uh, there was a very strong chance leading up to the fracture era that we were in the last chance saloon. Um, and if we didn't get something done there now, then we really were going to become a third world country. There was a headline in 1978 in the Daily Telegraph, and the headline was then, um, cheer up, things are getting worse. Meaning, and the, the gist of the article underneath it was that um, uh, things were getting so bad that, that there was a real appetite for radical change was build, building up. And finally, you know, she didn't try and do it all at once. She didn't try and privatise 50 big nationalised companies in, in, in one year. She did a few a year. Same with the trade unions. She brought the trade unions back under the rule of law. Uh, every other year, she, she had a, a, a bill go through Parliament chipping away at the legal um, immunities that the trade unions had built up over the years, uh, and thus brought them back under the rule of law and gave them back to their members.